Pastor Joel and I, and I'm Pastor Chris, this is Pastor Joel and I, are going to do things a little differently this morning. Um, We know how you love change, so... um, (laughs) Was that funny? That was funny? (laughs) Oh. Um, (laughs) We we decided... um, to preach a little differently. Basically, what we've kind of called this is a sermon in three questions. And what we've done is, Pastor Joel and I have briefly met and talked about this passage, uh, just to give some initial thoughts, and then kind of stepped away and said, rather than come in with a prepared sermon, let's focus on these three questions and dialogue back and forth. Now, this was our idea. We don't know if it was a good idea. Right. In other words, we're making this up as we go along. Right. So... Well, not entirely. That should go well. Up, but we don't know what's going to happen. We may argue with each other. Um, I promise I won't slap Pastor Joel. Um, what if um, I insult your wife? Would you <laughs> just keep my wife's name out of your oh, mouth? Whoa, 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 wow! You went there. I followed. Yeah, I, I did. Just, I'm saying, I'm this, saying. this is already. See, a bad it's already idea. a train wreck. That's it's right. already falling apart right here. <laughs> So we're going to, we actually have a time or two, because some of you might go, wait a second, you don't know where you're going, these are two preachers, you could go for like hours, you're going to get an appetite, right? No, yes. just kidding. Um, we, we have a timer, so for each question, we're going to be about 10 minutes. He's, it really would have been don't better be if you so were like a palm branch it, rather than like a lighter. You know, but, um, so we're going to go for each question about 10 minutes, and then when we get the warning, we'll take like a minute to wrap it up and move on. And like I said, we'll see how this goes. So... Um, any comments you have that are negative, please send to Radiant. Um, yes. All Jay positive King comments. at radchurch.org. I don't know. It's still an active email address. <laughs> it still is. That's <laughs> true, by the way. Well, well played. Well played. Well played. So the first question I'll, I will ask you, Joel, that we both kind of talked about is from what we heard Pastor Marv read, the passage we hear every Palm Sunday, what's your biggest question that you have about this passage? Oh, <laughs> I've got many. Um, really, it's, it's, uh, it's a question that I, I do every time I really study Scripture. Uh, it's, it's asking those questions of, you know, why here, why now? Why does Luke, in particular here, why does Luke uh, include what he includes but leave out what he leaves out? For example, did you notice as Pastor Marv read that passage from Luke that there was no Hosanna? Did you notice that? There's no Hosanna mentioned, and there was no Palms mentioned. <laughs> so the two things that we kind of equate with this particular Sunday, Palm Sunday, are the Palm Branches and the Hosanna. Would Luke and, call this like Cloak Sunday, you think? Or yeah, maybe Cloak Sunday. It doesn't have the same cloak. ring because they, the, they threw the cloaks down. So it's just a different twist, and every gospel writer is going to come at it from a different angle. And I think that that does influence, again, what we see in the passage and the message that Luke is trying uh, to convey to his audience. Why does he, uh, again, why does he not include these elements? Are they not important to the, uh, to the text? Are they uh, again, are, are they, are, have they already been covered with the other gospel writers, perhaps? And so he doesn't feel a need to, to even uh, address them. Um, certainly, he, he conveys the, uh, the, the main idea, but he leaves some of those things out. And I think, again, those are, that's an important question to get at as we try to interpret what the, the meaning of this passage is. So that's kind of the question I'm coming at. It's just like, what's Luke's intent here? What's he trying to convey? What's the message and, 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 and the theme and the idea behind uh, what he includes and what he doesn't include? So that's my, my answer. What about you? Well, may I answer your question? To give oh, you sure. My, 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 my response. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I, th- I think it's really interesting the things that Luke doesn't include. And, and part of my thoughts are, I think he's trying to strip down this, this, this event. I think that this event has kind of been made something more than it actually is. Luke is kind of taking a different take on this. Mm-hmm. I mean, when the, another thing that stands out is we often look at Palm Sunday as being about the crowds, you know, welcoming Jesus. But if you read Luke carefully, it's just the disciples that are with him. Right. So that's a huge difference. It's not like, you know, p- people in Jerusalem are going about their business. It's just this small group that have been following Jesus um, and probably following Jesus, the other thought to have is it's the Passover feast that they're on pilgrimage to Jerusalem as people do. Right. And in the midst of that, you might have other people who kind of caught sight of that. But I think it's to kind of to strip this down a little bit, yeah. um, just to get us to get more in terms of, I think we get more in the celebratory aspect, and there's a lot more going on here. Certainly, what Pastor Marv read, you have the Pharisees' reaction, mm-hmm. you know, you have J- Jesus crying, and then you even have the cleansing of the temple. He puts it all together. Yep. So this isn't the way we typically think of Palm Sunday, and I think Luke wants us to Absolutely. look at it differently. Good answer. Um, you took away everything I was going to say in the next question. Did I really? <laughs> no, just, geez, I... Well, my, qu- my, qu- my question that when I read this passage is I was really drawn this time to 
the statement that Jesus makes as he's weeping, which is, if you knew the things that made for peace. Mm. The question for me is, what are the things that make for peace? Um, you know, obviously, the implication is that, and, and that's kind of where I'm going to go later, continuing to reflect on this, that clearly what people, the people who are present there think are, are the ways of peace are not the ways of peace. And I kind of thought, so what are the wrong ways of peace from what we tell in the Gospels? And it's, well, there are some who want to overthrow Rome by violence, mm-hmm. so that's not the way of peace. There are some who are compromising with Rome who say we just kind of, kind of play the political game. That's not the way of peace. And then, you know, there's those, obviously the Pharisees are present here, who want to tighten up and better regulate the law. And even Jesus is saying that's not the way for peace either. And so then, you know, thinking about that, I'm like, okay, well, what's the right answer for peace? And it's kind of what we're going to see. You know, today's the start of a journey. It's the start of Holy Week. And so the answer to the question of what is the way of peace is loving sacrifice. You know, Jesus is going to sacrifice himself and love and, and in service to his country, if you will, to, to the nation of Israel. And, he's, and the way of peace is this idea of submission to God for the sake of those in need. You know, he's going to do this to those who are turning on him. He's not going to do it to a sympathetic or empathetic crowd of people. And then, I, you know, the other thing that just occurred to me thinking about the way Holy Week goes of what are the ways of peace, and this one was the, probably the most controversial for me, was that Jesus is living according to the spirit of the law, And probably one of the big spirits of the law that keeps coming back in the three years Jesus has been ministering is the Sabbath. Mm. And this idea that Jesus is going to rest in order to work rather than work in order to rest. Because if you think about it, and this is, I'm still chewing on this, Jesus doesn't do really, we talk about the work of the cross, but Jesus doesn't do anything when, from the moment of Monday Thursday on. He basically submits himself and allows things to happen to him. Mm. So in many ways, he rests, if you will, in God's will, he rests in that from the prayer of Gethsemane. And then out of that, he is later resurrected. And then that's where the work happens. And that's how the Sabbath is supposed to be, right? We don't work in order to rest. We rest in order rest, to work. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus is going to kind of model that as the yeah. way that we experience peace rather yeah. than chaos in our lives. Oh, that's, what do you think? I'm an internal processor, by the way. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I like that theme of peace because you see that throughout the passage. Even this whole idea, and we, we don't really have the time because that's another question I have of the passage. Like, why does he spend so much time on the procurement of the donkey? Mm. <laughs> right? But just that symbol of the donkey is, is a symbol of peace. It's not a symbol of war. It's Jesus doesn't come in as a, as a conquering king uh, into Jerusalem. He comes sort of as a, as, a, as a reigning king, actually, sitting enthroned in a time of peace. And so he obviously comes to bring peace, but, but it's interesting that the way, the way that peace comes is through the cross. Mm. And so it's that you know, element for us that I think it's hard for us to grasp that, again, when we think of peace, it's, it's to placate, as you mentioned, or it's to um, resist. Uh, or resist. It's, and, and, and truly what Jesus is talking about is that peace that passes all understanding. It's the peace that only comes from knowing God. And it really begins with, it's the peace of God. So, you know, when I think about that Hebrew word, you know, that shalom, that what that means, it's, it's that whole wholeness. It's not just peace of saying there's no conflict. Uh, it's the peace of saying everything is as it should be. And, uh, and oftentimes, again, when we look at our world, we know that things are not the way they should be. It's not just that there's war, because that's, that's a sign of a lack of peace. That's an obvious one. But even in our own conflict and relationships, and our own turmoil, our own anxiety, depression, and think about what a lot of people went through during COVID these last couple of years. It's a sign of, of again, just there is no peace because it's a lack of, of wholeness or a lack of, of just that internal Uh, shalom that Jesus has come to bring that begins with having peace with God first. Because if we don't have peace with God, we can't have peace with one another. So, you know, part of what I see in this passage, and and we'll get into a little bit more later, is that idea um, of of what he has come to bring. And yes, he's come to bring that peace, and it's that peace that the people don't understand. It's the peace that the Pharisees don't understand. Because they don't have a relationship with God, because they don't know him, they don't truly have that peace. I really like that. I mean, I, I, I think that, that dovetails nicely with the, the Sabbath piece, too, of this idea of peace begins out of our relationship with God rather than we get peace in our relationship with God from doing other things first. Yeah. No, I, I, that really resonates. Um, do you think, I mean, part of what you said about the, even the untying of the cult, do you think, again, that's part of why Luke does strip things down? Luke is trying to kind of get back to more of this idea of a, a, 
you know, not necessarily inverting our expectations of a king. He's making allusions to Zechariah, obviously, oh, yeah. and, 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 but, but trying to almost kind of set the stage in terms of sh- shifting it so it's not as familiar as being regal imagery and stuff like that with the hosannas and the, with the palm waving. It's tr- trying to sort of shift our idea that Jesus is not the kind of king that we expect. Jesus. Yes, I totally agree with that. And that kind of shifts for me, at least, into sort of the key idea or the key theme mm-hmm. of the passage. So if we can maybe transition into that question of what we see as the main theme because I agree with you I think Luke again strips it down to its bare minimum or he takes away some of that stuff that keep that maybe blinds us to what truly is going on and because the people's expectation of the king was somebody that was going to conquer Rome somebody who's going to come in and 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 put Israel back on top again uh, that was what Jesus has resisted all along in his in his ministry that anytime people thought of him as a king, even when, they, even when Peter claims him as Messiah, Peter doesn't understand what Messiah means. And I think Luke is really telling us, he's using this very messianic language from the Old Testament. I mean, there are allusions here to, you know, Zechariah 9 and, and Psalm something. And thank you. And um, <laughs> Genesis 49. I mean, there's all of these, these passages that that have these illusions. And I think that, again, he's setting us up to say, Jesus comes as a king, but not in the way that you expect. Not in a worldly sense, but in a heavenly sense. He comes as the anointed one, as the Messiah. But what that means is very different than what you expect. And so you see the, the, the response of the people even are kind of, or the, the different responses of the different folks, right? You have the, the disciples who are, are seeing this and they, they perhaps understand these illusions of the cult that has never been ridden on, the coming in, in peace as a reigning king, the, the celebration, the waving of the palm branches, all of that stuff. And they, they have this expectation that Jesus is finally going to set up his kingdom. And so they're celebrating that. They're praising On that. the timing of it, that it's Passover. So it's, exactly. this is, you know, this is yeah. the moment. Yeah. This is the moment. And so that's, that's why they're praising. And then you have the Pharisees here called out saying, hey, tell these guys to, to knock it off. You know, you're stirring up, I mean, for a lot of reasons, you're stirring up trouble. This could go bad for us. Rome is not going to be pleased if, you know, they start talking about a king. That could, that's going to cause problems for the Jews with Rome. Um, and then the people who are, are not mentioned in Luke, but in other passages, they, they seem to be very fickle. They kind of go along for the ride, right? Like right now on Sunday, they're, they're, they're joining in the celebration. They're joining in the hosannas, the palm branches, the whole thing. They're excited because I think they're starting, hey, maybe we have an opportunity here, you know, to, to finally be in charge. And yet by Friday, they're the ones turning on Jesus. And, and we kind of wonder, how does, that, how does that shift happen so quickly? And I think it's because they, they're really not rooted in anything. They're, they're, they're kind of rooted in their own, their own expectation, or they kind of go along with the crowd. They're not, it's nothing personal for them. They don't really have that relationship. Um, but it's within that that Jesus, I think, brings us what's truly happening here. And that's part of what I focused on is that, you know, I see Jesus in this as, and, and looking at his response. Like every, if we look at the disciples, they're, they're, they're praising God, they're singing in a loud voice, they have high expectations. If you look at the Pharisees, they're angry. Jesus is just sad. And it's something we don't think about. And one commentator called it the a triumphal entry, right? That, that there's nothing really triumphal for him. That he kind of, he allows it. But if you look at everything that Jesus does here, again, the inclusion of the weeping over Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple, these, these are elements that really tell us how Jesus is feeling on this day. And when we look at how Jesus is responding, it's not anger. Oftentimes we equate the cleansing of the temple with anger. Um, it's, I see it more as sadness. That as Jesus, and if you've ever been to Israel, I know Pastor Chris, you've led trips before. Um, is there still room on your trip coming up? We can maybe uh, advertise and fill a few spots. Not. Okay, Sorry. next time. Um, but, and I've been there, but I remember the thing that struck me when I went to Israel for the first time, uh, the only time, was that on that Mount of Olives, when you come over that crest, you, 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 can, you can picture everything that's happening here. And you here. can see the city. And you see it, you come over, and then it's just, and you just have this perfect view of, of, of the city. And, and you can just place yourself in this story as when Jesus gets to the top of that, that hill and that mountain, and you can look over and you see this giant city, and Jesus knows not just what's coming for him, but what's coming for the city. 
And that city as a representative of the nation of Israel. He sees what's coming for them. He sees their destruction. And it's not just a prophecy of, of saying, of, of judgment that says, well, if you don't believe me, then I'm going to destroy you. It's really a consequence of their, of their rejection of Jesus. That Jesus, and this ties back to what Luke has already told us in Luke 13. Jesus has already wept over Jerusalem. He's already said, I, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you in like a, like a hen gathers its chicks. I want to bring you under my wings, but you would not have it. You rejected me. And that's where he says, you won't see me again until that day where you cry, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's today. That's Palm Sunday. That's when Jesus comes in. But again, he doesn't come in triumphant to say, see, I told you so. He comes in sad to say, this is what I long for. I want to bring you in. And, and again, this is, I, I think, where we can really start to make the application. We'll talk about some more later. But this is the sadness that Jesus has for Palm Sunday because he knows what comes, not just for him, but for the people as well. He knows that this rejection uh, is going to cost them. It's going to cost them pain and sorrow. Much like, by the way, we can take this all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When you think of the rejection of God and his commands to Adam and Eve, that, that what happened was, was a cutoff. And, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. Because they rejected him, they rejected the Father. And maybe we even say it the other way around. Maybe it's because, as we see in the Pharisees, they've already rejected the Father, that they don't re recognize Jesus. Either way, there is a rejection. And oftentimes when Jesus talks about uh, the, his, his suffering and his death, that's what he, he includes the rejection. It's all of that tied together. Rejection, suffering, death. This is all what Jesus knew was going to happen. And it saddens him because this is not what he wants. He wants everyone to come under his wing, under his protection. He wants everyone to have that peace with God. He wants everyone to be reconciled. And yet people choose not to. Yeah, for me, the key insight is very similar to yours. It's a little bit of a different take, but very in, this, in the same line. It just really impacts me, especially even in tradition, how we celebrate Palm Sunday. The disciples are cheering, the religious leaders are jeering, and Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the second time, very in a close time, Jesus weeps again. There's like two times that stand out. We all remember the shortest scripture, you know, Lazarus' death. But Jesus weeps again. Jesus isn't smiling. And when we, when, we, or, yeah. when we enact this on Palm Sunday, we don't capture any of that at all. You know, Jesus has got tears in his eyes. If you think about that moment, the disciples are cheering, the, 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 the religious leaders are upset, and Jesus is crying. And, you know, let me put it this way. When you, if you're out in public with someone else, and all of a sudden if you're, you know, celebrating and you notice someone crying, <laughs> you'd be a really hard-hearted person if you didn't go over and go, are you okay? Yeah. Why are you crying? And so for me, why is Jesus crying? And as you said, he laments at what's coming. But I also think, and this is where I'm going in a little bit of a different direction, but it's related. He laments based upon what he says because Jerusalem and its people can't tell time. They can't tell time. Meaning, and it's, it's an odd thing to say, right? Like, they, they, they basically, they don't know what time it is. And it's an odd thing to say because prior to Jesus crying, everything else, which is the part we remember and celebrate, is they're throwing their cloaks down, they're waving palm branches, they're shouting Hosanna. They're actually, they are celebrating. This is it. This is the moment. Just like we talked about. This is the Messiah. That blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And even the religious leaders seem to recognize something is happening and they're trying to quiet, quiet it down. And yet, what the implication of that is, everybody thinks they know what's going on. Everybody thinks they know what time right. it is. But Jesus is crying because they don't know. They don't know what time it is. And that really strikes me, you know? And, it, the, and I love what you said, and you're right. When you, if you have the opportunity to go to Israel and you take the Palm Sunday walk to be able to see the city and you can picture where the temple would be and how he would see the mm -hmm. temple, it's this awareness that for thousands of years, thousands of years, God had been preparing Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is representative of the people, of the nation. He had been preparing Jerusalem through the prophets, for the coming of the Messiah. And the, the irony, the sad irony, is that they're not able to recognize the truth of God's Messiah when he comes to them. Right. And what's even more ironic and sad is they think they do. Give it a week's time and it'll be very clear they don't. Because the very person who's being hailed as the Messiah, whether it's in praise or as a threat, is going to be the very person who's, who's de denounced, rejected as being no more than a common criminal, a curse up on a tree. You know, and I, and I just... I. What just, and I'm going to go back to you on this in a second, but because it comes back to the application point, this idea 
of seeing but not seeing. And that comes a lot up a lot in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't weep for himself today. Jesus isn't weeping for himself, though he should for what's coming. Mm -hmm. Jesus weeps for the city. Jesus weeps for us. And I I just want us to sit in that for a second to think about how most of us love Palm Sunday because it's such, such a celebration and we're celebrating while Jesus is crying for us. That puts a whole different spin on things, right? Yeah, it's going to ruin the pancake breakfast. <laughs> you know? But Jesus does that, right? He I does. Mean... And, 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 and to me, it's sitting in this space, and this will dovetail to where we're going to go next, of kind of the takeaway of, and I know it's a hard place to sit in. I know we'd rather just be celebrating today, but we can't celebrate if Jesus is crying. And we have to step back and go, why are you crying, Jesus? And why Jesus is crying, among other things we could say, He's crying because the people that he's come for perceive themselves as being close to God, but they're farther from God than they can imagine. Mm -hmm. And they're farther from God than they're willing to accept. Yeah. That's That's good. It's tough. I feel like we should stop there because that was really good. But we're not going to. We're not going to. Um, (laughs) Never do. We never know when to stop. No, I like that because that is, that's, again, you mentioned the timely, or the, they, they don't know what time it is, and Jesus says that right there at the end of, of the passage that Pastor Marv read, that, you know, that part of this, part of his weeping is because they do not know the time of their, of, of, of their arrival or Jesus' arrival, that this time that's been, you know, prophesied for thousands of years. I mean, there's been no prophet in Israel for 400 years. You know, finally the prophet shows up, finally the Messiah shows up, and they miss it. And they miss it. They don't get it. And, and because they're looking for that, and I think the same thing happens for us, by the way, is it, uh, to dovetail in, is that we look for the victorious Jesus. Like, we like victorious Jesus. We Make don't, names. Right? Jesus who takes names. Absolutely. So, you know, we, 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 we sort of, and, and that's why, again, even from Palm Sunday, it's a celebration, right? And many people will go from Palm Sunday to Easter, right? It goes from celebration to celebration, and, and because that's what we like. We like the victory. We like the Jesus who conquers. We like Jesus who is, is, is winning. We don't like Jesus crucified. We don't like Jesus who loser. suffers. The loser. The, the one, again, the one who weeps. The one who kind of interrupts sometimes our celebration because, you know, we think we know what's going on. And that's probably the worst place to be is to think you know that where you're at when you really don't. And that's what Jesus is weeping over. And so, again, I think that ties into to how I see where we go from here in this um, is, is, again, we need, to, we need to walk this journey with Jesus, right? We need to walk the journey of Holy Week um, and, and all that that entails from Palm Sunday to uh, through the crucifixion. And I love that you're doing that Holy Saturday thing uh, where, you, again, you're just kind of sitting in that place between death and resurrection, I mean, isn't that where we all live right now? You know, we're in this in-between, and it's a hard place to be, and, you know, we're, we're awaiting the resurrection, and we, we hold on to the hope and the promise, but we're not there yet. And so, we, again, we, Holy Week is a good reminder for us to kind of just walk that, that journey. Take those, those steps with Jesus in his, in his suffering, in his rejection, uh, because I think we have a lot more in common with Jesus in the suffering than we do in the, in the victory. Yeah, for me, the takeaway, and this, is an, this probably is an obvious one, but always when you read scripture, for me, it's who are we in this story? You know, we're, we're not, we can have this, we have this aspect that we're observers, and, and in one sense we are, but we're called to be participants. That's part of why we're given the gospel. So in this story, who are we? Who are we in this moment? I mean, there's like three groups, right? There's the disciples, there's the Passover pilgrims who have been coming with Jesus, who are coming with great expectations for the moment for Christ. There's the religious leadership who don't want to stir up trouble or controversy, and, and that's a big one, you know, and I love what you said, because it's so true for the Pharisees. I mean, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, back to peace, Jerusalem has a fragile peace right now, and Jesus coming into town and people saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, jeopardizes yeah. a fragile peace, but that really isn't peace at all. And so the religious leadership is, it has been kind of a twofold thing with Jesus of, you need to tighten up the rules, not let, you know, you need to be, we need to get more rigid, more separateness, But it's also, as Jesus continues to do what he's doing, it's not just that he's lax, he's shaking the very foundation of this, of how things are done. So who are we? I mean, are we, 
Are we the disciples who are, have great expectations for Jesus, but there are expectations for Jesus right. rather than Jesus' yep. expectations for us? Are we the religious leadership that wants to play politics, that wants to be bound by theological rules? We don't want to upset people in power. We want to try to work, work alongside. And then there's a third group, which doesn't really get mentioned, but they're there. And maybe this is us too. The group of people who are just going about their day otherwise preoccupied, otherwise unaware that anything's going on and anything's about to change in the next couple of days. And for some of us, this just strikes as, you know, some of you showed up for Palm Sunday. God bless you. Where have you been prior to today? I mean, just putting it on it in the sense of we, you know, we show up for the moment, yeah, you're right. but we've been busy. And that's, you know, pastors, we hear that all the time. We're worshiping together. Oh, I'm busy. So is everybody. In essence, what you're really saying is you're too busy to be here. And here isn't necessarily just us. Here is busy worshiping, coming, sitting at the feet of, of Christ. And, and that's a group on Palm Sunday. I mean, we don't think about it. There's a group of people who, in the midst of everything we're talking about, would have no idea what we're talking about because as far as they're concerned, right. nothing's happening. Right. And it's that who are we in this story? You know, yeah. who, who do we identify with? And I was thinking about that even though I was driving in and I passed the, the flea market over at Golden West. Yeah. And it's like, the parking lot is full. I mean, you can't even get in there at like 8 o'clock or 8.30. And, and I'm kind of laughing because I think, you know, yeah, I hear that a lot too. It's like there's a lot going on. And I understand. It's not to shame anyone. I understand that with, you know, the, the overscheduling of our kids and, and just the busyness that, that has been thrust upon us. But it's that same idea that there's a whole group of people that just have no clue what's happening. And that, but that ties into what our job is too, right? Yeah. I mean, that we're carrying on. We talked about this in our church last week about seeking and saving the lost. That that was Jesus' mission. That's why he came. And this is what saddens him because he came to seek and save the lost and the lost just rejected him. They just said, I'm not lost. And that's part of what I see too when you see just what is going around us in culture that, again, they're completely oblivious or apathetic. And so it, the challenge for us, again, is to bring that message of peace to them that, you know, here God wants to reconcile with them. God wants to, you know, have this relationship, and yet they're unwilling. And I think it, instead of being angry about it, it, it makes us, and we should weep over that too. We weep over the lostness of the people who are oblivious or, again, apathetic to what Jesus brings. Well, and, and an interesting thought when you were saying that is, I wonder sometimes if that third group of people who are busy or un otherwise unaware, part of what feeds that beyond the things that you said that are, that are spot on is the other two groups, when they look for a second at the other two groups, either those who say they follow Jesus or those who have, quest who have concerns about Jesus, they're arguing with each other all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no, it's like, so why do I want to be a part of that? Right. And that's the interesting thing that also just strikes me when we talk about those first two groups. Those who are cheering for Jesus and those who are jeering Jesus actually have something in common. And what they have in common, and this gets back to Jesus crying, is they both are trying to fit Jesus into their expectations. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. They would think they're opposed to each other, but in fact, they're actually have, they're united in that they both are guilty of trying to make Jesus fit into what they expect. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think for us too, I mean, this is the challenge and the danger is, is, uh, is that we, there's such an expectancy on Palm Sunday. You know, Palm Sunday kicks off Holy Week for us and, and we're expecting Easter and we know that Easter comes because it comes every year, right? Resurrection always happens. And so since we know the ending, we, we sort of fast forward to the ending to skip all the bad parts. And, and yet Jesus reminds us, you know, the, the challenge, again, of both of these groups of people, even going all the way back to his temptation in the wilderness, is the, the, that we can't have the kingdom without the cross, right? You need the cross. We have the, the journey is through the cross and only through the cross. Mm. And so some of this, again, it's the disciples, I think, are in that, in that place of, of expecting Jesus to do to establish a kingdom, establish his, his throne, but not do it through the cross. And I think we can do the same thing too, Yeah. You, right? You, we have this, yeah. like you said, it's like we, we have the, the danger for us is that we take our picture of Jesus, our ex expectations of Jesus, and we put them into our, our mold, our box, instead of saying, wait a minute, we have to be shaped by him. He is not shaped by us. Well, and, and let me, if I may, you know, that we're guilty, we can be guilty of the same over-familiarity. People had their expectations from thousands of years of the prophets of what the Messiah would be, what, and there was difference of opinion, but had their expectations. 
We've got hundreds of years as the church, and we come to Holy Week, and we, as you said, we know this story. We know how it's going to play out. We've participated in how many Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, if we come to those services at all, and Easter Sunday. But the reality is what I, why I, we do it again every year. Why do we tell the same story that we all know? It's not for the people that don't know. That could be part of the invitation because people who are coming in, in, in the, at the end of the story are going to be a little bit confused mm-hmm. as to what's going on. It's for us as the church that we retell this story. And why do we retell this story? We retell this story because we believe we're reliving it. And what that means is that this week and every Holy Week is not about us doing our due diligence religiously, remembering what Jesus went through for us, following Jesus and saying, oh yeah, that was really lame and that was tough, that was rough. It's entering into the fact, starting on Palm Sunday, on this path of where we may end up going through this week and having to yet again submit our expectations Mm -hmm. and have our expectations die with Jesus on the cross. Yep. And come to Sunday and all of a sudden be reborn to new possibilities, to new ways of thinking. And I, I do think there is some connection. I think you're right. This idea that we, lo- we like to go from Palm Sunday celebrating, no crying, celebrating all the way to Easter Sunday celebrating. And to, to ignore or sort of put to the side, I don't know if you really can get there. I think you get a different Jesus if you do that. There's no death without resurrection. We all love resurrection, but you can't get to resurrection unless you die. And Jesus says, not just that he's going to die for us, we all love to repeat that. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for us. We can talk about death like that. Amen. Hooray. Hallelujah. Jesus (laughs) died for us. But Jesus also says, die to yourself. Mm -hmm. Take up your cross and follow me and die to yourself. We don't have to die the way Jesus died, but we are called to die to ourselves. And this journey is about, if at no other point in the year, our year of life, another year of life, this week we get on the road and we once again commit in following Jesus to die to ourselves, to die. And part of that death to yourself is dying again to your expectations of God. Who is God supposed to be? Who do I got, want God to be? Who do I, how do I expect God to show up in my life? And in dying to that, being reborn, resurrected to what God's expectations are. Not just for you, but for us, for the world. Well said. I'm going to stop there because Drew's waving his magic stick at me. Well, I, the, only, the, only, it's the, the only thing that I would just say that, that, that just struck me too, and, and uh, <laughs> part of it that this is, is <laughs> I'll tell a funny story that I might get in trouble for. Um, <laughs> so we had Ash Wednesday. You know, we did this Radiant Grace together. We started on Ash Wednesday. We started this Lenten journey, and now here we are again on Palm Sunday. Uh, and the day before, we needed ashes, and Pastor Joel had forgotten to burn up some palm fronds for the ashes, and so he was like making a mental note that he'd have to do that. But, you know, the service was going to come up that, that night. But that spark, that, what was just funny about that is they were like laying in, in his office and he just stepped over them and forgot about them completely. That he needed <laughs> to burn them. That's true. To burn them. <laughs> but outside of that funny story, if you, if you know this tradition, and I, I think some of you do, but not all, on Ash Wednesday, the ashes come from the palm fronds of, of Palm Sunday the previous year. And in light of what we've talked about, I want you to reflect on this, is if those palm fronds, which Jesus doesn't ask for, but the people that day just get out and start Mm. waving, if those are iconic or representative of our expectations for Jesus, they get burned and they become the ashes that mark our heads with the sign of the cross on Ash Wednesday. That's good. It's that, again, a visual way of thinking about how we die to our expectations of God and those expectations that we've died to start the journey again the following year with the sign of the cross, hopefully reminding us to stop trying to fit Jesus into our box, Mm -hmm. but instead allow Jesus to actually blow up the box, Mm -hmm. blow up the box altogether. Good. Good? I think that was great ending. Yeah. Well, we just, I got to know, I don't know, Pastor Joel may not, did this work? Was this okay for you guys? I think you were just asking for applause. That's what I thought. I wasn't that. asking for applause. I didn't tell them to applaud. I mean, they could have done this. They could have just, you know, that was fine. So no, was if we good. did this again, you'd show up, you'd come back. Okay. Okay. And, and again, who do you think was better looking up here? Today? Totally kidding. Do not answer that question. Do not answer that question. What, do you want to offer a word of prayer? To, yeah, let's pray. Let's pray. 
Gracious God, we do uh, uh, celebrate on this Palm Sunday what this day truly is about, and that this is uh, the, the, the beginning of the end for you, uh, the purpose and the, the culmination, the climax of your mission here on earth. And we recognize, Lord, that, um, that all of the things that we bring, all of our own expectations uh, need to die, that they need to be set aside in order for you uh, to, to reign, that you are in control in this whole situation, that you knew exactly what was happening uh, Lord, and, and, and uh, again, we need to submit to you and, and be shaped by you and not the other way around. And so, again, we confess our own uh, expectations and baggage that we bring, the things that we put on top of, of you and your mission uh, here on earth. And we pray, Lord, that you will use this, this week as a, as a time to, um, to reveal to us our own sinfulness and our own need for a Savior. Uh, and a, a Savior and a Lord who will, who will reign over us and, and reconcile us, Lord, to bring us true peace, the peace that comes from only knowing you. And so again, we thank you on this day. We thank you for the ability to come together and to worship and to learn and to grow and to um, be shaped by you on this special day. And we give our lives and our week to you. In your name we pray. Amen.